In the annals of great mountain fortresses, there are few like head shoots, few as wealthy, as powerful, as corrupt, or as damned. Almost hidden away in one of the most inhospitable places in the world, Headshoots was founded amidst great evil, surrounded on every side by monsters, demons, and undead, in a dark land where no living thing except foolish dwarves would dare stay. Headshoots grew in spite of these challenges. It faced terrible pain, countless battles, and awoke the evils slumbering within the mountain. But it recovered and grew even stronger, becoming what seemed to be the sole beacon of light in that blasted place. Then it fell, suddenly, brutally, and sharply, on the point of its own sword. Of all the inhabitants of Headshoots, the greatest were Nemo 2342 and Holistic Detective. Nemo, the unstoppable blade, no doubt the greatest swords dwarf of the age, his victories were countless. Holistic, the invincible shield, wearer of trail machines, the fellowship of right, an adamantium plate mail that was once one of the wonders of the world now lost to the world. She was so secure in her invincibility that she dropped the hammer she was trained with in favor of killing her enemies with a rat leather backpack. There were many great champions of headshoots, but these two were truly the heart of its military, its fame, and its arrogance. They would be its doom, too. A dark power slept under the mountain, and one terrible night, it bewitched Nemo and Holistic, summoning them to its home in the deepest part of the fortress. There, the darkest of magic turned these two noble champions into ferocious, bloodthirsty skeletons. Very little is known about what happened next. There were no survivors save for a single dwarf who claimed to have evaded the horrors by leaving the world altogether. Only legends can tell us anything about the massacre as headshoots, as Nemo and Holistic roamed the halls, striking down every living creature they met. Sometimes they fell dwarves in a single blow. Sometimes they took the time to break every bone they could reach just for the sadistic thrill of it. Yet inevitably there was not a single living thing left in headshoots. Here the legends grow even more unreliable. Some say that the two skeletons, their lust for violence unequaled in the history of dwarf kind, turned on each other out of sheer fury. Others, such as the cult of Nemo, maintain that Nemo regained control of his actions and attacked Holistic Detective in an attempt to extinguish her threat to dwarf kind. The result was the same. Nemo severed both of Holistic's hands, but could not pierce the adamantium shell of Trell Machines, and Holistic counterattacked with her own teeth. Latching onto Nemo, she bit and shook him until his body was shattered, and she stood alone in headshoots. That was long ago. Now... Horrifying monsters roam this land. Holistic Detective has created her fell spawn. Misshapen, dwarven monstrosities that wish only to destroy. A single holistic spawn is easily capable of destroying dozens of untrained dwarves, and only the most powerful champions can hope to stand against them in numbers. Worst of all, every fearful dwarf knows that somewhere out there, still lurks the detective herself and the mysterious entity that twisted a noble dwarf into a night terror. Foolish dwarves still seek gold, jewels, and adamantium in the world underneath the surface. In spite of the lesson of headshoots, they travel to remote, unforgiving, hostile lands to establish fortresses and make names for themselves. Soon, a new party of seven dwarves will strike the earth or the ice. Hopefully, they shall do better.
Come join 185 drunken, belligerent, greedy jerks and the dwarfs named after them as we witness the highs, lows, battles, tragedies, amazing feats, and crushing incompetence of a Dwarf Fortress succession game. Yes, this looks like an extremely long LP. Don't panic. It's probably shorter than it looks, really. This game generated an enormous amount of reader participation, and there are lots of pieces of art, short stories, and journal entries. The archivist has tried to preserve as much of this as possible, as events in the reader posts were frequently incorporated into the Overseer updates. You can find any additional content below the relevant Overseer post. You don't have to read it, but if you want the full picture, we suggest you do. This LP is a direct sequel to Dwarf Fortress Headshoots and contains major spoilers for it from the first post. Regarding this LP, this playthrough of DF will use a slightly modded version of the game, which includes additional threats and allies, okay, maybe no allies, but there are new animals to hunt and be hunted by, one new mega beast, and three new civilizations, all of which will invade us once we've amassed enough wealth. I've adjusted the stats on many creatures to be more challenging, and you might find a special new gem or two. Don't worry, this won't be like the Orc mod, where we are immediately assaulted by unbeatable enemy armies and forced to wall in and play a boring defensive game. Instead, we'll progress from Goblin and Sand Raider, no tougher than Goblins, invasions to invasions by the unholy offspring of our fallen champion of the last LP, Holistic Detective, and Frost Giants. Nor will there be a ton of foreign weird shit in it. This is still Dwarf Fortress. You have arrived. After a journey from the mountain homes into the forbidding wilderness beyond, your harsh trek has finally ended. Your party is seven to make an outpost for the glory of Enod Lear. There are almost no supplies left, but with stout labor comes sustenance, whether by bolt, plow, or hook. Provide for your dwarves. You are expecting a supply caravan just before winter entombs you, but it is spring now. Enough time to delve secure lodgings, ere the Sasquatches get hungry. A new chapter of Dwarven history begins here at this place. Udib Govos, Syrup Leaf, Strike the Earth. In early spring of 138, the romantic glaze of the Gate of Climaxes founded Syrup Leaf. Year One The Rule of Spoon Boy. The Chronicles of Syrup Leaf, excerpts from the diary of Spoonboy Rakos Tirith, Weaponsmith. Spring, Year One. The wagon is stuck. The left rear wheel is broken. Our carpenter Skaw says it's unrepairable. I asked him to make a new one, given the abundance of wood we were carrying. Somehow, he never learned how to make a wheel. We'll have stern words with his master when I return home, if we ever do return. Our hunter, Nemo, is about to go and look for some food. I told her we have plenty, but she still insists on going. She apparently saw a mole nearby that looked delicious. I told her not to wander too far. There are strange noises coming from the valley to the east. I do not dare peek over the edge in case whatever's down there sees me. It seems it went well. Nemo's calling out to us, but what? the hell are those? Armak, help us. I just saw Nemo die. Even now, as I hide here behind the wagon, scratching away at this journal, it flashes before my eyes. Nemo standing proudly over the slain mole, waving, but then a fluttering of leathery wings. Claws and fangs and screams and blood. And, oh, Armak, blood. They tore her apart like she was made of paper. Alas, poor Nemo, I should never have let her go off on her own. I made everyone else abandon the wagon for now. I'll stay hidden here until it's safe to recover our supplies. And our dead friend. I've ordered our miners to start digging a safe distance away from the wagon. While they're doing that, the rest of us are moving what supplies we can safely grab to the new location. A group of troglodytes are massing around Nemo's corpse. 
I think they're looking for us. Or maybe they're just attracted by the smell of death. Armok, save us all. Progress is being made on the dig. The rest of us work on building a rudimentary wall with a stone. We're not skilled masons, but it should be enough to keep the troglodytes at bay. Moving the supplies to the new location continues to be dangerous work. Several times we've had to drop what we were carrying and sprint back to the safety of the dig. I just pray we can get everything set up before the weather worsens. This is a particularly inhospitable part of the world. Spotted a couple of the creatures that killed Nemo today. They appear to be half man, half bat. Some sort of Armok damn Batman. They're constantly on the move, flying around the area. So far, they haven't spotted us, but it's only a matter of time. In other news, Skaw claimed he saw a flying cow. I'm not sure what it was, but it certainly wasn't a cow. Perhaps a giant cave swallow or a robin. I'm starting to worry about that boy. Get the feeling he's not altogether there in the head. Suspicions confirmed. Found Skaw sleeping outside today. I'm convinced he's gone a bit strange. We'll have a chat to him once things are a bit more organized. Just thankful nothing found him while he was asleep. Apart from that, summer has arrived, though the weather does not seem to be getting any warmer. Things seem to be progressing well. We haven't had any more attacks, and most of the supplies have been moved inside the wall. I'd ordered our miners to dig west in order to get as deep into the mountain as possible, but they ran into what appears to be a bottomless chasm. Thinking we might be safer on the other side, I ordered the construction of a bridge, but no sooner had the bridge been completed when three Batmen came swooping in. They chased Rincebrain down the corridor, but then two of them inexplicably ran away. Armak be praised. The final Batman charged into the main room, only be to be torn apart by a couple of our dogs. Were these the same creatures that made mincemeat of Nemo? Thoroughly confused, I ordered Bob the Third to go and finish the work on the other side of the chasm. He encountered one of the Batmen, but instead of running back to the safety of the dogs, he decided to take a swing with his pick and killed it, suffering only minor injuries. It seems like the Batmen aren't so bad after all. Autumn has arrived, and along with it, a caravan. But they weren't carrying anything of interest. I'd given Skaw a mechanics workshop to play around with, since he seemed to like tinkering and it kept him out of trouble, so I traded some of the mechanisms he'd made for some cheese. Food will be an issue in the future. With our hunter dead and no water to irrigate a farm, we'll have to make do with what the caravans bring us for the time being. Of course, we also have one less mouth to feed. Rest in peace, Nemo. I swear we'll recover your remains as soon as we can. The rest of autumn passed quietly. The traders outside gave us some extra protection in the form of their guards, so we didn't have to worry about attacks from the east. I ordered the tunnel to the chasm closed off for now. Maybe in the future we can cross it to see what's on the other side. Winter is... dull. We can't go outside because of the cold, so we've been passing the time naming the various Batman that we spot. The dwarves have given a resident Batman the name Thob Kadolgeb. The dwarves have given a resident Batman the name Momuz Lumashli Bash. They have given a Batman the name Mebzuth Rimtarusan. They've given a Batman the name Mebzuth Zonasal. They've given a Batman the name Aban Athol Atsul. They've given a Batman the name Enod Kossoth Tilesh. Skaw is happily working away making mechanisms and levers. I'm not sure what most of them do, but it keeps him out of trouble and that makes me happy. The past year has been draining, but I think we're safe for now. I've decided to pass the mantle of leadership on to Vox Nihali our armorer. Once winter breaks, I want to personally recover Nemo's remains. Her death was my fault, and the fact her bones are still out there in the hill gnaws away at me. Hopefully I can give her the burial she deserves.